Hello, everyone. My name is David Shear. I'm co-CEO and co-founder of Origin Investments. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm joined by two longtime team members and leaders at Origin, David Welk, who's uh, calling in from Charlotte, our Charlotte office, and Tom Briney, who will be calling in from our Denver office. Uh, Dave joined Origin in 2011 from Deutsche Bank Reef. Um, he's been instrumental at building out our equity investments and leads that team across the country, all of our regional offices um, in the markets that we invest. Tom Briney, um, he leads our debt platform. He came over from Blackstone in 2011 as well. I'm really excited to have them. They're super busy and they're able to join us today. Um, we're covering today uh, an article that we've written for the last three years. Um, and last year in particular, we write it every year in December. Um, and then the following year, we grade out our predictions because it's our top 10 predictions for multifamily real estate um, and the economy. Um, last year, our predictions were quite a bit different uh, than others. Um, we predicted that uh, inflation was not transitory last year and that it would show up um, in a much um, more dangerous way for the economy than maybe people thought, um, and also that interest rates would rise quite a bit. Um, and that's proven to be true. Um, one of the things that I'm really proud of about Origin this year is um, we didn't just make those predictions, we positioned the portfolio in a manner uh, to withstand those shocks um, in a very defensive manner in 2011, I'm sorry, in 2021, um, that our investors have benefited from uh, greatly this year. And then importantly, we hedged our interest rates, um, which have, at this point um, made over 4%. We, we manage about 1.4 billion and there's been a 4% uh, gain just through those hedges. So roughly $50 million has been gained this year that's allocated to our funds pro rata um, for their hedge uh, position. So um, we're not a firm that just observes and writes. We actually um, have the ability and do execute on our opinion. So this year, um, I believe that we're going to make a lot of predictions that are very counter trend again. Um, and importantly, we are very hard graders. Um, we're committed to transparency. We'll come back in a year and um, share what we what we predicted and what we did and um, what in fact happened. Um, we're going to cover a lot on this webinar, so um, we're going to try to breeze through in about 30 minutes a lot of data. Um, I say data. A lot of people say data, um, so you can uh, you can put that in the chat. Is it is it data or data? Um, and after that, we're going to do 30 minutes of Q and A. Um, you use the Q and A function. Um, we're going to really try to be interactive. We try to do that. We're going to try to stay on as long as possible to answer all of your questions. Um, so with that, um, let's get started. And I'll be covering the first slide and then I'll hand uh, the second question to my colleague, Dave Welk. Um, our first prediction for 2023 is that a recession um, is in fact coming. Um, what we're relying on here more than anything else is Origin Multilytics. Um, origin Multilytics is a machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, intellectual property that we've developed the last two and a half years. Um, we believe it's industry leading. And, and what it really is doing more than anything else is predicting rents in multifamily because that's exclusively what we invest in at Origin. Um, but what we found is it's also incredibly predictive on a, on a macro level. And so here we're looking at uh, multilytics and its um, predictions of the last recessions. And when the probability of recession exceeds 80%, it, it typically does in fact happen. That's what multilytics is predicting. And you can see that that, that has happened four times. Uh, most recently it happened in, in COVID. It was a very shallow recession. Um, but you can see now um, it, the predictive power is looking you know, almost close to 90, 95%. Um, we believe that, 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 that in fact, a recession will happen. We also don't think that it's going to be um, a shallow recession in the way that um, the COVID recession was. Um, we don't think that it's gonna be like the Great Recession either, um, which lasted much longer, um, but we do think that it's gonna be um, a medium-sized recession. There won't be um, a shallow landing, um, those types of things. Um, one of the things to think about um, and, and this is not multilytics, this is my own opinion and the opinion at origin is um, the Federal Reserve is not in a position where it can cut interest rates 
and do QE um, to help smooth the business cycle. Um, in fact, they're on the other side of this where they're, they're raising rates to try to get inflation under control. So, you know, it, it's unlikely that if the economy slows, the Fed is just going to simply turn around and start printing money to, to, to restart the economy. They're actually more worried about inflation. And, you know, even as recently as, you know, this week, the last few days, what we've seen again and again is, you know, the market tends to discount what the Fed is doing and, and maybe they're close to the end or maybe they'll reverse course. And then the Federal Reserve will come out and say, no, 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 we're not, we're not close to the end. We're, we're very serious about inflation. And then you'll see the market correct in a, in a violent way, um, the stock market, I should say, which it's done again this week. So, you know, we're off five or six percent off the highs of three days ago, solely driven by the Federal Reserve, simply reiterating what they've said for the last six months, which is we're serious about taming inflation. We're not going to stop. Um, we're not looking at other factors like employment or GDP or the economy. Um, so I think given that, we're not going to see the Fed intervene to, to make this recession that we believe is happening um, a shallow recession. Next slide. Uh, thanks, Dave, and good afternoon from Charlotte. Uh, as Dave mentioned, this is our next prediction for 2023, which is we're calling for negative rent growth. And if you've tuned into some of our prior webinars, you've heard us talk in detail about our proprietary multilytics uh, rent forecasting tool that Dave just touched upon, which is powered by machine learning AI. And we've really incorporated this into our decision-making really over the past uh, year and a half to two years since we've made it fully operational. And you've also, if you've tuned into prior webinars, have heard us calling for negative rent growth really for the past several quarters, uh, which is long before the data was present in the market in the last two to three months uh, to actually show negative uh, rent growth that's occurring. And to Dave's earlier point, many of our peers not only have been uh, consistently calling for positive rent growth to end this year, um, but they're they're looking at, and, and, and sorry, by, by peers, I mean third-party research providers, uh, some of the industry stalwarts are calling for uh, very positive rent growth. And we'll talk about here in a second, some of the, we'll pick on two, two markets in particular. Uh, so these two markets that we'll talk about, Tampa and Phoenix, uh, have seen some hyperbolic rent growth in the last, uh, really since coming out of COVID, uh, to the tune of about 40% rent growth over the past two years. Uh, as you can see, uh, that we're showing here some, some pretty substantial declines. Uh, and, and many of our industry um, Research providers that are out there are suggesting six to nine percent positive rent growth in these markets still after unprecedented, you know, forty percent rent growth over the last over over the last two years. Um, so this this slide here shows a snapshot of our tar of most of our target markets here. Um, and so as I, we talked about, you know, we're showing declines in Phoenix and Tampa to the tune of about negative five percent uh, per next year. Markets like Colorado Springs, for example, where we have four projects underway, uh, and some of the markets in the southeast and in Texas are actually, uh, we're forecasting to see pretty moderate rent declines over the course of next year. And while we're painting a pretty negative picture for 2023, later in the presentation, I'll provide some silver linings on our forecast for 2024 and beyond. And spoiler alert, we feel pretty good about the long-term prospects uh, of rent growth in our markets. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to Dave and he's gonna touch on some of our predictions uh, on inflation for next year. Um, back to inflation. Um, inflation, we believe has peaked. Um, it, you know, this graph certainly shows that it, it peaked and it, it's starting to come down. This is just CPI measured over time. Um, importantly, the real return is the nominal rate minus inflation. And so even in periods of very, very low um, nominal rate, and what I mean by that is the, the yield on risk-free assets, the yield on a 10-year note, um, which was sub 2% um, a year ago today. Um, that, that's how interesting this year has been. Um, this has been the largest percentage increase in interest rates I've seen in my career. Um, and I've had quite a long career at this point. 
um, you've seen rates go from 1.7% to as high as 4.35%. Today, I believe they're around 3.5%. And I'm, when I'm saying that, I'm talking about the 10-year note yield. That yield, um, even at very low rates, isn't low if inflation is very low. Because what investors are really after is, is called you know, the real return. So the return minus inflation. So if you have a 2% 10 year note yield, but inflation is one, you have a 1% real return. And that's the environment we were in, in COVID 2020 and the early 2021. Um, CPI wasn't really picking up in 2021, what was really happening. And what was really happening is there was a lot more inflation than, than what was being measured. And so the real return was much, much lower than, than reported. Um, inflation got as high um, as you know, well above 8%. Now it's about 7%. So a couple things. One, 7% is too high. It's too high, certainly relative to a three and a half bond yield. You're getting a negative three and a half return, uh, real return. So the, what the market is telling you is it also believes that inflation is peaked. And it will return to long-term um, positive real returns, meaning inflation needs to be, you know, two and a half percent to, to produce that real return that people are looking for. Um, I actually believe that's that's true, but I don't think it's going to return to two and a half percent as quickly as people want, <clears throat> and uh, I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, but I do believe that inflation is peak. We won't see levels in excess of the highs of you know in May, June, July of this year. Uh, next slide, please. So here I'm, I'm bifurcating, and I'll do this on two slides, um, commodities that really affect um, the economy and, and certainly multifamily. Uh, lumber is a huge input into our development, um, which we're you know, one of the larger developers um, in the country in our regions at this point. Um, we have thousands of units across our, our markets um, in development. So in a typical deal, um, there's millions of dollars of, of lumber needed um, to build. Um, you need it for framing um, certain projects more than others. Um, certainly our, our garden stick product uh, requires a tremendous amount of lumber. And what we saw in the lumber market was a market that traditionally was about $300 a board foot. Um, and then during COVID, you know, due to supply chain and, and shutting of lumber mills, um, even interesting things like there was a Canadian trucker strike um, so that shut the border between Canada and the U.S. Uh, all kinds of things happened to drive up the price of lumber. Um, here, the chart shows as high as you know, 13 or 1400 a board foot. Um, it actually got higher than that in certain regions. It, it was more like 1700 a board foot. So if you think about that in perspective, that's a, that's a four to five X increase in lumber. Um, that would be like the S and P going from four thousand to sixteen to twenty thousand, and then importantly, it went all the way back down, and, and that's that's what I'm really driving at here is lumber today is around four hundred a board foot, still a little bit higher than the historical, but certainly within the range, and and three to four times lower than the highs. So we're seeing um, this um, in in the markets that we're building the cost to build is coming down in these areas. And obviously that's deflationary. Um, and so I'm, I'm citing this as on the commodity side, we're seeing that inflation has peaked. And in fact, that, you know, the, the cost of these goods is going down quite a bit. Um, next slide, I'll talk a little bit about shipping containers. So shipping containers, and this is gonna affect all goods. Um, a lot of the goods that we buy for our, our projects that we're building or improving need to be shipped. Um, and then, of course, a lot of the goods that you consume in your life need to be shipped. Um, and so when shipping containers go from 2,000 a crate to as high as you know, 10, again, it, here it peaks at 10 or 11,000 a crate, but it actually was much higher than this um, in certain markets. I, I heard uh, anecdotally stories of more than the 14 to 15, 16,000 a crate um, as well but they're all the way back down to basically unchanged. And so, you know, here you're talking about an inflation input because it affects every good, every price of every good um, that's, that's come all the way back down full circle. Um, 
I think it's very predictive of a normalizing supply chain um, and, and, a, and a minimizing of the effects of inflation in these areas. Next slide, I'll talk about one thing I don't think will come down. And that's wage inflation. Um, here's why I believe that while inflation will go down, um, I think that we'll, um, in, the, in a year from a day, we'll be in sort of that three and a half to four and a half range. Um, if, and if I had to widen it, I would just simply widen both sides, three to five. Um, still not the Fed target. Um, because I think wage inflation is, is sticky. Um, and that, that's for a couple of reasons. One, um, one is simply when wages go up, it's very hard um, to lower salaries once they're raised. Um, if you think about it, if you're a business owner um, and you've you know, rewarded your team with, with raises, or in this case, um, with just cost of living raises, it's very hard the next year to say, you know what, now I'm taking them back. And so this tends to go in one direction and, and not come back. Um, the other is um, there's a lot of leverage still with labor and, and, and the team um, element, um, certainly in, in specific industries. And there, there's a lot of inequity in this. Um, candidly, I think it's, it's probably good in the sense that um, over the last, you know, certainly 10 years, um, five years, three years, you've seen a lot of wage inflation in the college educated and um, very skilled labor force market. And there hasn't been nearly as much in the non-college educated uh, market. And that's created um, a widening in equity in the US. Um, we're seeing the reversal of that now. Um, you, can, you can just think about this intuitively. Um, you know, technology companies are, are generally downsizing. They, they produce too much capacity during COVID. They hire too much. And, and now they're having to sort of right size their business and a lot of them are laying off. Um, same with investment banking, um, record amount of transactions in 2021, lots of new hiring, they're having to right size that now. Um, but at the other end, you know, you have a tremendous need for service sector, um, whether it's food services or transportation, logistics, um, manufacturing, hotels, um, they can't find enough qualified labor. And so those, those inflation, the, the wage inflation is really going up in those areas. Um, and so there, there, there's a distribution and people tend to focus on, on maybe the one side and say, well, how can there be wage inflation if um, there's technology companies that are laying off? It's because there's actually more businesses that are hiring. They, they just happen to be in different industries. And, and there's this inequity of labor um, maybe there's an overcapacity in one area, but there's there's an undercapacity that's much larger somewhere else. And then on the right, you have um, you know this is really speaking more of the unionization movement, which is you know picking up steam again. I, I'm not judging it; I'm, it, I'm just observing it. Um, there are companies that traditionally haven't had unions, and now that you know they're they're forming unions, and you know when unions negotiate, this is happening with the rail. Uh, workers now, they negotiate, you know, medium to longer term contracts, you know, three, four, five, six year contracts. And in those contracts, they're getting, you know, wage increases each year. So four or five, six percent, um, maybe higher. And so it's really hard to have wage um, control, the, the control of that inflation if it's contractual over long periods of time. Um, so I, I would point to that as um, something that will keep Wage is high, and, and wages being high isn't necessarily bad. Um, it, it certainly helps um, the families that are getting those raises, and, and there is more consumption if you have more um, income um, as well. Next slide, please. It's because of that labor that I believe monetary conditions will continue to tighten even further. Without a softening in the labor market, it's going to be really, really challenging to break inflation over the long term and the mistake was made in the early 70s and you had this period of what appeared to be lowering inflation and actually went back to a higher inflationary environment and that's when things got exceptionally painful and jerome powell and the federal reserve is convinced or, or convicted that they will not make that happen again they've been very clear about that but the market hasn't been listening totally so the, the market has been a little bit too optimistic or too hopeful that a pivot will come soon and if you go back to Q1 of this year, the, the expectation was that the final raise would happen at the end of 22 
and then it was early 23, and then you'd be rate, you'd be cutting interest rates by the end of 23. But this has been a very painful cycle. I think people are trying to be optimistic. To put into context, though, the largest hike uh, ever seen in Fed funds rate was in March of 1980. So this was after inflation had been an issue for the better part of a decade in the 70s. And they actually increased interest rates by 5%. So they increased the Fed funds rate from 15 to 20% in that one single raise. And then it drifted between 16 and 20 until May of 1981, when it really started to relieve uh, in a really consistent pattern. And that was a 15 month period held between 16 and 20%. So although it's painful to sit here today at four and a half, going to five and a quarter, five and a half, I don't know where it ends, but I do know that the market has been overly uh, optimistic about the monetary conditions. Um, and I think that it's going to, to remain here for a while. However, I don't think it'll be as bad as it as uh, it was in the 80s. Um, and what's so different, this, the thing that's different this year from then is we have two levers to play with. The graph that's shown here is M2 or, or the monetary, the amount of money in the system today. And you can see uh, where the Fed increased um, or made their contributions during COVID, the $4 trillion of stimulus that were added to the economy. But what you don't see in here is the trillions of dollars that were added in 2009. And that's something that I really want to draw people's attention to is that in 2009, when the stimulus was added to the economy, the economy had materially slowed. There was a liquidity issue. There was shrinking uh, job loss. I mean, we all, those of us who were in the business then, remember the losses being not 500 laid off here, 1,000 laid off here. It's tens of thousands at a time. You couldn't get that. There was actual economic contraction. So when the, when the Fed put money into the system back in 2008 and 9, it was to keep the monetary, the M2, the monetary uh, supply in a consistent level as opposed to letting it drop off or go back up. When you look at it in 2020, there wasn't an actual, there was a technical recession, but there wasn't really a recession because it was so quick where people lost jobs and they were hired back relatively quickly that $4 trillion really just went into the monetary system. And that's part of what's driving the inflation today is because there was so much money in the system in, in a really shocking manner, there was a lot more demand for products and goods and there weren't enough people to, to work to make those, pro those goods. So what can we do now? We were raising the Fed's fund rates, but the other thing that we can do is reduce the M2, reduce the monetary supply in the United States. And what's happening now is the Fed is reducing their balance sheet. It was $7 trillion, it was $8 trillion, and they're lowering it by about 90 billion a month. So it'll take some time for them to lower it, but it's really a two-pronged attack that we have now that we didn't have in 1980s because the Fed didn't have a balance sheet in the 1980s the same way it does today. So we're really attacking inflation from both sides. And first is Fed funds, which everybody's aware of. The second, which most folks are, are less aware of, is the, this restriction of monetary conditions via money in the system. And that's a function of the Fed uh, selling the bonds that they have on their balance sheet, pulling that money out of the system, and really... Um, kind of attacking inflation from both directions. So cap rates, historically, uh, cap rates spread between the 10-year treasury and multifamily cap rates has been about 150 basis points. And what that is, is uh, a risk premium, the, the risk that investors demand for the risk above treasury, which is zero. Treasury is generally considered risk-free because the U.S. government can, can tax higher and pay off its debts and multifamily is not considered risk-free. And the, the risk premium on average is, um, is about 150 basis points over the last 30 years. Now we can see periods of time where it gets much tighter. If this graph were to go back in 2007, you would actually see the blue line and the gray line cross over um, where the, it was inverted and the uh, spread was actually negative. Conversely, in early 2020, when the Fed dropped interest rates to zero, the 10-year treasury went below one, uh, cap rates were still in that 4% range. And so there was a huge spread, 350 plus basis point spread at that point in time. And over the last 18 to 24 months, that spread has been uh, tightening steadily. Um, there's some volatility in the cap rates that aren't necessarily shown up on this chart. There's, there's similar to the other ones, these have been smoothed out to, to show less volatility. But what I expect to happen is cap rates will continue to march higher. These um, right now we're showing about four and a half cap against all asset classes within multifamily across all markets. And I would expect that over the next six to 12 months, those, those cap rates continue to go higher.
Dave referenced the S&P 500 earlier and the, uh, the quick up and down uh, correlation. This is very similar in where we had a very quick uh, valuation increase in multifamily and it's come back down to a, le a level that's reasonable that four and a half cap rate and is, is a somewhat reasonable level for cap rates today in an ordinary growth environment. But if you go back to Dave Welk's prior uh, slide about negative rent growth, a four and a half cap is if you're expecting normal inflationary type growth. In a shrinking uh, uh, rent growth environment, I would expect cap rates to move out even further to reward investors for taking the risk in a de decrease in interest rate environment. So I do think cap rates will continue to march higher as a 10 year uh, and, and maintain that 150 basis point spread, which is a little bit collapsed right now. Okay, so now we're gonna transition to, while I agree with Dave Welk, he, he said, he talked a little bit about the long-term secular strength of multifamily. And I completely agree with him uh, on that. I do think that there is a, the potential for distress coming to the multifamily in the next, well, I'll call it 10 to 18 months. Um, and this is solely driven by valuation. Um, valuations were too high. Um, relative to the long-term growth of multifamily. And so if you think about what happened, and Tom just spoke to this, you know, when the Fed um, took essentially short-term rates to zero and were uh, buying mortgage bonds and all kinds of risk assets to, to keep the economy going during COVID, and I'm not judging that. It, it's just simply a reflection of they, they reacted to what was an external shock no one predicted. Um, I do think they probably kept that... Um, put on the gas too long. I think they should have stopped doing that in the summer of 2021 as people were going back to work. But generally, I'm not judging it. Um, but what happened was all assets became overvalued. And it's not multifamily assets, it's not real estate assets, it's all assets. Um, it's all stocks, it's private equity, it's companies, it's venture, it's crypto. And, and we saw it. Um, silly things like SPACs were being created and people were investing in them. and you know, it, it, there was just a lot of meme stocks. I could go on and on. Like looking back, it, it's pretty obvious um, that there was too much money in the system. So here we have multifamily. It's this um, asset that's always in demand. Um, it's, it's secularly strong, but there were too many transactions that happened in 21 at irrational pricing. And so again, what did Origin do during this period? Um, I guess I would start with what we didn't do. Um, we haven't bought a stabilized asset, a stabilized rented cash flowing multifamily building in 30 months. So like the first thing we did is we, we didn't acquire any assets because we thought it didn't make sense at these valuations, even though we believe in the asset class. You, you, can, you can believe in a company, but you still have to value it and, and look at the price paid versus you know, the point forward expected return. You can overpay for a good stock. You can also overpay for a good multifamily building. Uh, we, we thought that was happening. The other thing is um, the investments we did, we did make were incredibly defensive. And so for example, if we're developing and we're a very large developer, what we're really doing is we're building for 250,000 a unit when the market is trading 350,000 a unit. And we believe we can execute on the, on the building side at a high level, we've proven that. And so we believe there's 100,000 a cushion. And, and that's, that's very important uh, because if there's a correction, we're losing profit, we're not losing money, we're not losing equity. Um, and that's one of the ways we did it. The other way we did it was preferred equity. So here we're, we're in a protected position where the first loss is common equity and we're really 20% or more uh, protected in the capital structure. Um, so a lot of risk management is about the decisions you make two years ago, last year, et cetera. Um, it's not simply reacting to things that happen in real time. That's an element too. The stress is coming to the market. Why? Uh, there were too many transactions in 2021 that started with, I bought a 3-3 cap. I bought a 3-4 cap. I bought a 3-5 cap. When, when you're saying that, what you're really saying is you're buying a, a multifamily building um, that's 30 times earnings, right? It's a 30 PE. Um, we didn't believe that's sustainable. Like the, the typical earnings PE in multifamily has been 
you know, anywhere from 18 to 24. And that makes sense. Um, sometimes it's been lower, sometimes it's been higher, but at 30, you're really pricing in protection. Um, and typically multifamily grows rents by two to 4%. You know, a, a 3% growth rate is a good growth rate um, historically for multifamily. And that growth in conjunction with um, strong dividends from the asset um, produces, you know, your kind of nine to ten percent return that's tax efficient over time. That's what multifamily historically has done, and that's why it's such a good part of your portfolio because it it provides steady growth um, led by income, and it's non correlating with other parts of your portfolio. Well, in 2020 and 21, rents grow by, grew by 15 to 20 percent, and Dave covered this in Tampa uh, when he talked about rent growth, but it's really true of all of our markets, Phoenix, Austin, um, Denver, Charlotte, Nashville. I mean, it was happening, Orlando, um, so Colorado Springs, et cetera. So there needs to be a normalization of those rents. Um, and we believe it's gonna come through one year of negative rent growth. Now, why does that matter? Um, there were too many deals that were bought at very high multiples last year, driven by low interest rates. And importantly, a lot of these uh, managers, they made two mistakes or, or anyone, not just real estate managers, anyone who bought it. The first mistake was they overpaid and priced to perfection. The second was um, they made it worse by putting on variable short-term debt. And so the reason you would do that is again, Origin doesn't use a lot of leverage. So we have no reason to do it and don't. But if you wanted to put on 75, 80, 85% leverage, you could do it in 21 through a debt fund who would lend that much. And uh, in exchange for that, you would get variable rate debt. So that's priced over LIBOR or now SOFR at a spread. And it's you know two to three year debt. So it's short term in nature, which makes it dangerous because you have a long term asset paired with the short term liability alone. But it's also variable rate, which is dangerous because you're pricing off the zero SOFR, which is now four and a half. So if you were paying two and a half percent debt in 21, and the two and a half is simply the spread that the debt firm asked for, for the risk, right? Because the risk-free rate was essentially zero, SOFR was zero, but they're in the business of making money. So they say, okay, we'll lend you at 250 over SOFR. That's 250 when the Fed rate is zero. Well, now the Fed rate is four and a half. So your borrowing rate is seven. You bought a three and a half gap. There has been rent growth. So let, let's assume that now you've created a four cap. We call that return on cost. But essentially what I'm saying is you're, you're building income from three and a half to four through rent growth. I'm giving you credit for that. But you still have a negative 300 borrowing rate versus what's being unlevered return from the property. That's not sustainable. To exacerbate that, the capitalization rate, and this is a good thing, cap rates have gone from three and a half to, in my opinion, four and a quarter, four and a half right now. Not a lot of transactions, but that, that's where I believe they are. Certain markets, four, others, four and a half. That's kind of where we are. But if you think about that, now it's a 22 to 24 multiple on earnings. In January of this year, it was 30. So there's been a massive amount of de-risking in the market. And rent growth has muted the overall effect of the asset valuation. But the net net is a lower multiple on a higher earnings, we call it net operating earnings, is still lower. And so we believe that there's been an asset level correction anywhere from you know, five to 10%. Um, and so that, that sounds like a lot, but you're also getting dividends that, that can mitigate that um, somewhat. But if you're someone who borrowed 85% at two and a half, now you're paying seven. Now you have a loan maturity, but your asset level uh, valuation is lower and it is, you're gonna need to put in a lot, a lot new equity. You have to put more equity into the deal at refinance. And so there's two opportunities that come out of that. One is we can recapitalize deals and we will, so we, we can, help these owners by putting in new equity, whether it's common or preferred, 
if we believe that there's still a significant amount of value to the equity in the deal, we can do that. We're already seeing that. And, and uh, I think I'll turn it over to Dave at some point to talk about, we have a, a mountain of opportunities right now in that space. I would call it the recapitalization space. If there's more distress, so now let's layer on negative rent growth, which we believe will happen next year. And we believe it's short-term in nature. The following year, it will recorrect and we'll see strong rent growth and, and, and so on. But next year, this will become a real problem if NOIs are going down and they have an interest rate that's seven, not two and a half, and assets are also going down in value. We think there could be opportunities to just take over the lender's position. Um, equity will be wiped out or um, take over the lender's position at a discount to the note. And one of the things that I want to stress is it's not that I want this to happen. I don't. And it's not that it will happen. It's a probability. I think that it's, it's in the realm of possibility for sure. Um, if it does happen, Origin was built out of these environments. You know, we were built in 08, 09, 10, 11. Our highest returns have been in these periods. Um, we're very familiar at restructurings, discounted payoffs, short sales, foreclosures, bankruptcies. We've done them all and we've thrived in that environment. I would say the difference this time is we're uniquely positioned in our markets in multifamily. If, if there are opportunities, we'll see them and take advantage of them. Um, we did well last time, but we were a new company. You know, we were brand new in 08, 09, and 10. I think this, this time we're, we're better positioned to take advantage even than last time. Um, so I'm excited if this happens. I'm not saying it will for sure. Um, and I'm simply painting the picture of why it could be possible. The world is a series of probabilities, nothing more. I think this is probable at this point. And it's not driven by secular problems. Multifamily is an amazing asset class. It's driven by overvaluations that existed everywhere in the economy um, because of COVID and the Fed policy. Um, Dave, do you wanna talk about real quick, um, some, maybe one example of a recapitalization that we're seeing now? Yeah, happy to do that, Dave. It's actually, uh, well, in terms of recaps, um, we have seen a couple opportunities come our way. Um, I was thinking we we're going to maybe talk a little bit about PREF, which we can do later as well. Um, but in terms of recaps, we, we've seen a few groups that have come to us um, who are short on refinance proceeds. And that's a, that's a broader problem that we're seeing in the marketplace in terms of just overall um, hesitancy and, and a pullback from lenders and willing to provide proceeds to the level that they did even you know 90 to 120 days ago. Um, so what, what is happening uh, across the board and, and will accelerate is when developers are looking to refinance a project and they go out and get an appraisal and then ultimately um, take it to a lender and, and the lender looks at it with different sizing requirements certainly more stressed uh, testing that they're implementing into their sizing, what it's doing is it's reducing the amount of refi proceeds to, to take out the construction loan uh, in some cases. And so we've been, we've been approached by a few groups who have said, like, you know, we still believe we've got a lot of equity in the asset. You know, we're in a moment in time in terms of, of, of interest rates and lender uh, pullback and sizing requirements. You know, would you look to to infuse some capital into the deal, um, you know, based upon our cost basis, or even in some cases maybe a restructure lower cost basis? Uh, we have seen only a handful of those deals right now. It's a little bit early uh, in the cycle to see that, but we expect that trend to pick up significantly uh, next year. Yeah, and then just more broadly, Dave, speak to what's happened in the preferred equity market for new multifamily development, uh, because it's been remarkable, both the capital structure side and the uh, the absolute return side. Yeah, in the last several months, we've seen a dramatic shift as a result of the condition that I just mentioned, which is lenders pulling back, sliding down lower within the capital stack. Um, so they're not taking, they're not occupying uh, the same kind of last dollar exposure that they used to uh, with their senior dollars, they're pulling back to 
from what was 65% of costs pretty regularly achieved in the market down to 60. Uh, we've seen groups move to 55%. And it's seemingly the, the, the number du jour in the last few weeks has been 47% loan to cost, which is the lowest I've heard uh, or most conservative position I've heard senior lenders go into, frankly, since 08 and 09. So we're seeing a huge pullback um, in that position. And what that's allowed for is for us to take advantage of that much more uh, favorable position where senior lenders historically would get paid, you know, two and a uh, two and a half spread over SOFR on that position. Um, so today, in today's terms, uh, you know, that's that's a six and a half, seven percent uh, all in rate, depending on where SOFR lands. Um, we are getting to occupy that position now at a 14 percent coupon. So we're filling that in and, and we're coming down. Uh, proportionately from our last dollar exposure. So historically, if we were at 85, you know, now we're coming down to 80, in some cases, 75%. So occupying that, that, that portion of the capital stack between, you know, 50 roughly and 75, 80 at a 14% coupon feels substantially better than where we were even originating PREF six to nine months ago, which was sitting between 65 and 85, and getting paid a low, you know, 11 and a half ish, 11% coupon for that position. So we feel much better about the, the subordination levels that exist of, of so more common equity has to come into the deal um, to sit uh, in a first loss position behind our pref. We're getting paid higher rates, sitting in a more protected position within the capital stack. It feels frankly much better today uh, than we did six months ago. And then we we will talk about costs and, and that side of the equation, but we do see the cost of construction moderating now, and believe that it will uh, flatline to a degree and start heading negative. And we're already starting to see that in some of our markets throughout the country, notably in Texas and Florida, on a particular project, a few particular projects where we're seeing cost declines of one to four percent. We think that's going to continue into next year, and so if costs are coming down. Um, and we're sitting in a more protected position, we think that's a, a pretty great spot to be in. Yeah, and, and going all the way back to monetary policy, um, and Dave then will cover build for rent. So you can, you can put that slide up, it's fine. Um, monetary policy is trying to take money out of the economy because it's overheated and there's inflation. And they can control um, the M1, but the M2 is really up to lenders because that's the money multiplier and then moves into M3. What we're saying is the Fed is, is doing its job. Um, the banks are, are pulling back. And so we're not getting a money multiplier. And, and, and it's another way of saying, you're going to see inflation come down. We're seeing it in real time. And then as it affects multifamily going forward, only the best deals will get done. And luckily, we have this huge funnel and we look at thousands of deals. So we can find the few that still have 30, 40% margins that are worth doing. But last year in 2021, too many deals got done that weren't the best deals, but they got done because the equation still worked. Interest rates were low, cap rates were low. All of those deals won't be financed. And so going forward, if you look out three or four years, we already have an undersupply of housing. It's about to get way worse. I mean, we're going to see the same thing we saw in 08 to 11. That's when our housing undersupply started because nothing could get financed. Think about what Dave's saying. It's happening again. We're part of the solution and we'll get paid a good return for some of these deals. But we're only going to capitalize the deals that are the best deals. We're going to pass on nine out of 10 too. And those deals will die on the vine. And what you're going to be left with is you'll wake up in 2024, 2025 and say, man, I'm glad I own multi because there's a lot of pricing power because there's just not enough of it relative to the population. And if you think about the areas we invest in, the Southeast, Texas, and the Southwest, that housing shortage is much, much worse there because you're seeing this massive migration and, and we don't believe that's gonna stop. So with that, Dave, you can speak to, if you don't mind, the real problem which is home ownership and the relative inexpensiveness of renting versus buying, even though renting is expensive, it is. 
that's why we think rents are going to you know be flat to negative next year buying is way way worse and that's what's fueling the the boom here yeah and i'll thanks dave i'll, I'll touch on a few topics that you just mentioned um within the bill for rent segment um, which our prediction here is for significant demand to continue in 2023 within this space for both renters and investors alike. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with this type of subtype of multifamily, it's often called by a variety of different names and acronyms. Um, built for rent is often referred to really as uh, attached or detached rental townhomes, uh, sometimes called BTRs and built to rent. Um, also mixed in with this grouping is SFR, single family residential or single family rentals, um, which are, are truly what they are, detached single family homes that are rented out in a purpose built community. Uh, and many of these projects can have a, a mixture of, of both townhomes, single family, and in some cases they have the conventional, um, what we call flats, uh, apartment units, a three or four story um, portion of the project uh, is conventional multifamily units. And as Dave mentioned, uh, the cost to rent certainly has increased, but in the last, since the start of this year, the cost of home ownership has far outpaced that. And that's driven by the fact that the average 30 year mortgage today is six and a half percent. And when we started the year, it was three and a half. Uh, that's an 86% increase, which has created this huge affordability issue for otherwise would be home buyers. And then you compound that with the fact that there's been a 50% increase in median home prices across the country since COVID. And the National Association of Home Builders suggests that some 88 million households, so that's about 70% of all households in this country, can't afford the median home price in the US. And so this is gonna be a huge boon for the BFR space. And especially we can consider the limited amount of supply that's coming into this market. And we're showing that here. There's about 80, 180,000 units that we anticipate delivering across the country by 2025. And we talked about it earlier, how many units in total multifamily deliveries just in 23 alone. That's about 575,000 units. So that is, if you're thinking about a percentage of the overall national deliveries and thinking about that on an annual basis. And we're talking about, you know, roughly 10 to 12 percent of the total multifamily units being delivered are comprised by built for rent. Dave hit on, on the topic of we are uh, woefully short of housing units in this country. By most measures, we hear is somewhere to the tune of 4 million units, um, both rental and single family that we're shy in this country. Um, so there is a huge shortfall. This is still a more affordable option than owning a more attainable option for folks. And what we like about this product type is it it, it addresses demand from, from a huge swath of demographics across the country. And it's widely um, uh, utilized by millennials and boomers, um, folks with families, and then we'll see Gen Z uh, we believe as as that next largest cohort makes it through the 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 rental pool, which they're arriving now and will continue to build over the next ten years. We see the same demand continuing from that cohort. So overall, fundamentals are exceptionally strong. Um, we believe that because of the slowdown in construction for a single family, for the reasons that we just articulated. Uh, we're going to start to see in our scene labor and material availability um, uh, soften or labor labor prices soften, material availability uh, improve because historically the home builders have represented something like 60% of, of the entire labor force and material needs for construction. So multifamily has been a, a minority component of that. Um, and we'll see some of that pricing power come back to us over the course of the year um, and likely go down. So what's happened really in the last, I would say, quarter and a half or so, uh, some lenders really started going to the sidelines kind of mid-year. But I would say, you know, in Moss, we, we started to see lenders start to pull back on their first and foremost, they were starting to reduce their um, the, the leverage levels. So they, they started looking at 
you know, hey, we, we see that valuations may be moving or debt coverages are being constrained. Let's go ahead and start pulling back on the amount of leverage that we're willing to provide, you know, to, to developers within the capital stack. So what was historically around 65% loan to cost um, sitting in that position on the capital stack between senior or between equity and debt that created that tranche on the right. Um, and I'm talking more generally because historically we, we have been a very active provider uh, in preferred equity, which is really that, that kind of midsection between that sits between common equity on the top and, and um, uh, senior debt on the bottom. Um, that, that middle piece has grown in terms of the, the need to solve the hole in the capital stack really in the last quarter or so. So what, what used to be a 65% kind of last dollar exposure from the senior lender has moved down to 60, uh, has retreated to 55, and has of late, I've been starting to hear lenders quoting at 47% loan to cost. So what that's doing is creating this larger middle wedge for us to participate at a much, uh, much more, um, risky position for us to start our average exposure at. So now we're filling that void between, you know, I'll just use 50% as a round number from 50 to, uh, to, to 75, 80%, whereas we used to occupy between 65 and 85. So we've slid down the stack at a much more protected position. And we've been able to expand our underlying coupon rate or preferred return rate uh, accordingly, uh, we've moved that out almost 300 basis points from you know low 11s percent range about six months ago to now firmly with the 14 percent range. So, really, the best of both worlds. We we've slid down the risk spectrum, and we're getting paid more to do it. So, really, we're going to see a lot of opportunities. Uh, we've seen them already uh, coming out of COVID um, in in tw late 2020. 2021 and, and early 22 were pretty active for us within the space. Uh, 23 and beyond, we really see an opportunity to fill that void within the capital stack. Tom, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that. No, I, we're seeing a similar thing in the Freddie BP space and in the credit markets in general. I don't have much further to add. I think that the opportunities in preferred equity uh, in 2023 will be substantial. We've done 22 deals totaling about 230 million of equity uh, currently in our portfolio. And I would expect us to hopefully replicate and, and, and double that next year. So I think it's, it's the place to play next year. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, uh, or pick up from my earlier discussion on the forecasts for 2024 in our markets and beyond. And there's a lot, to, to, there's a lot in this slide. Uh, and I don't expect folks to fully digest it uh, in real time while they're looking at it. Um, but the big takeaway here is that that we're looking at a, a pretty significant recovery in 2024 and beyond across really all of our markets. And we feel very bullish about the recovery and future rent growth from the declines that we already talked about that we're gonna, we expect to see in 2023. And I want to pick on Tampa and Phoenix again. And you can see that after 2023, you know, we're showing high, high single digit and to double digit rent growth in 2024. Uh, and with both of these markets, roughly 4% compound annual rent growth over the next five years. And that includes the 2023 negative growth that we talked about. So that's certainly an above uh, normal uh, inflation run rate for rents. And, and the reason why is because we talked about this before, these markets have changed uh, for, for the better um, but aren't unwinding. You know, some people folks that there some some folks thought that the immigration from COVID, the work from home trend was going to allow for, you know, this kind of temporary shot in the arm for demand. And folks would ultimately move back to uh, the northern or western Midwestern cities that they came from. We don't believe that's the case. We believe that, you know, in the markets where people have relocated to uh, they're, they're going to see continued uh, labor market expansions. The quality of life that folks have become accustomed to when they've relocated will keep them there. Uh, and then they're, they'll oftentimes, you know, as I mentioned before, they're taking their uh, higher paying salaries from other markets and keeping them there. 
But beyond that, what they're really enjoying um, relative to where they came from is the relative affordability um, that you see in our markets. You know, the average rent uh, in a market like Charlotte across the entire market, you know, might be sixteen hundred a unit plus or minus. You know, whereas if they relocated from, um, you know, Boston, for example, that that's you know five to seven hundred dollars a unit higher across the marketplace. So. There's there's a quality of life component that we believe is is forever uh, permanently sticky to the folks that have relocated to our markets. Uh, the laggers on this slide here are Houston and Denver, but I should point out that we don't invest in a market. I mean these are these are market ranges. They're very broad based. They're an amalgam of our very as I mentioned granular forecasts that we can go down to the address level. And that's what we invest in. We, we invest in properties located within a very specific location within a broader market. So if you were to peel back Houston and Denver, there are absolutely locations within both of those markets where you will see strong rent growth, in some cases, you know, rivaling those of, of the market rent growth that we see in, in Tampa and Phoenix over a long period of time. So just want to point that out. We're not investing in a market per se. We're we're investing you know, certainly at the address level. And that's the granularity that we look at when we uh, are underwriting and, and, and making our rent growth assumptions out in the future. So I think that is the last slide, Dave, and we are ready to open it up to Q&A. You know, that's such a good good point, Dave. We don't invest in cities. We, we invest in submarkets. And that actually starts with we map each city and we're only really even looking for deals in 30, 40% of the city. Um, and so if you think about that, you know, yes, we invest in 11 or 12 cities, but it's these you know, pre-selected areas based on the feel of our team members who live in the cities, but also Multilytics, which is identifying the highest point forward expected returns, neighborhood by neighborhood, address by address. Um, the other thing I would say is um, because we've been using negative rent growth in our models all year, um, we are paying, uh, whether it's developing, paying for the land or, or preferred equity, because that's what we're really doing now. Ultimately, if we buy a, a cash flowing asset, we would use the same dialectic, which is, hey, the economy is going to be slow, rents will be negative, and we'll still meet our return based on the price paid and the inputs into the model. So, you know, my point is, even if you're in a city that has 1% rent growth for the next five years, that doesn't mean we won't make 20% on our investment. It just means that you need to pay the right price for the asset, for the point forward growth. It's no different than stocks, by the way. You're trying to pay you know, cheap pricing for companies that will grow um, or really cheap pricing for companies that will grow slower. Um, in either case, you can make money. Um, real estate's no different. Um, I'm gonna transition to Q&A. Um, and I'm, I'm excited that I have Dave and Tom to, to answer some of these questions. Um, Dave, if you don't mind, you can, you can lead by um, asking the questions and you can um, give them to me or Tom. Um, but before we start, I know, and thank you for uh, sending in, we, we had quite a few questions that were sent in prior and please do that because uh, it really informs um, Dave and Tom and I or whoever's doing the presentation, what we should cover um, in Q&A and the presentation itself. One of the questions that came up a lot was um, what's going on with Blackstone's BRE and how, how we're processing that information. Um, and so I wanna address that before we start Q&A. Um, so first of all, Blackstone is a company that I hold in high regard. I, I think that they um, manage their company very well. Um, and I think that they're very good at being a large manager. Um, Origin, that you know, Quite frankly, a lot of our clients, you know, we have about, I think, 3,300 clients at this point, um, investment partners at Origin. Many of them are also in BRE. So it's not really a, a either or. Many of you are in both. Um, and I think that's actually a fine strategy because BRE is a $100 billion fund. And, you know, our Income Plus fund is a roughly $400 million fund. So we're a small cap fund and they're a very large cap fund. Um, and because we're small, we can take investments a lot differently than Blackstone. Uh, Blackstone can't 
because they're raising so much money every month, they have to allocate it into common equity positions. Um, a lot of the times they're buying portfolio companies, um, they're taking public companies private, um, doing things that allow them to allocate a lot of money at once. Um, we're trying to invest you know, 10, $12 million at once per deal. Um, they can't look at deals like that. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't move a needle enough for them. So um, I would think of us more as a rifle shot and, and they're more uh, of giving you exposure to the whole market. Um, I covered this before, but probably the biggest difference um, in what we're doing and what they're doing, they're common equity positions. And so it, it's not better or worse, it's just different. Um, they have unlimited upside in what they do. That's what common equity has. And, and most of our positions were preferred equity, meaning we don't have unlimited upside. And, and Dave said this very well. He said that we're getting you know, a 14 or higher coupon. That's the terminology of a lender. We're lending to the project. And because of that, you know, typically right now we have 20, 25% subordinated common as first loss. So if the asset were to go down 15, 20%, we're still not affected. But if you're in common equity, you're bearing the whole loss. Um, how it's affected origin, because the, the issue with BREIT is a lot of their, um, a lot of the Blackstone clients um, are looking at it and saying, well, maybe I should get out. You know, the economy's slowing. Maybe your valuation of your share is too high and, and they're, they're redeeming or they're trying to get out. Um, and so like the question becomes, you know, are people redeeming at origin? And the answer is no, um, we don't have any investors um, that are redeeming. You know, I believe there was one, but as a percentage, it was, you know, it's so low, it, it's, it's insignificant. Um, and I believe it was for a, a, a personal reason. I mean, sometimes people um, have changes in their lives and they need to address that liquidity. Um, I believe that people aren't redeeming an origin because we have such protected structure within the fund. And that's back to what we wrote about last year. Um, you can pull up the article. That's what's you know really interesting is we, we post all this stuff. So you know, we're, we're both online, you can Google it, but you can also go to our website in the education section, this is all there and we're on the record. And importantly, we did things about it, right? So we, we positioned the funds very defensively. Um, it's my belief that not only will people not redeem in, in the origin funds, but that they'll be rewarded greatly for not redeeming because we're gonna outperform all of our competitors in, in, a, in a significant way um, in the coming years. Um, we have in the past seven years too, but I'm, I'm more confident that it'll happen in 23 and 24 because of the decisions made for the last two years um, that were positioned correctly. Um, so I want to uh, move the Q&A. Thank you, we have a ton of questions and that's what we look for at Origin is interactiveness. Um, Dave Welk is gonna lead those questions. And um, Dave, I just noticed, um, unfortunately, I, I have another thing I have to get to. Um, so unfortunately, this is live TV and I've got to move to the next thing. If you don't mind leading Q&A and you can answer along with Tom, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for your time uh, and everyone, our partners and you and Tom. I'm going to be checking off. Thanks, Dave. So I'll take you through the, uh, the Q&A and uh, pass a few back to Tom as well. So the first question actually is pretty well suited for me to address. Uh, this question comes in from an esteemed development partner of ours actually here in Charlotte. Uh, uh, Terrence, thank you. Hello. Uh, the question was projected rent growth forecasts for Charlotte. And on the presentation, I know we had, had put um, a sampling of, of our target markets on the slide. We had included Charleston um, and did not include Charlotte. So I think hence the question um, and really, to, to answer your question somewhat broadly, because as we as I mentioned previously, we do go submarket by submarket, address by address. Broadly speaking, Charlotte we anticipate to perform somewhere you know right in line or in between the projections for Atlanta and for Raleigh. And so, if you look at the rent growth forecast for those two markets, um, we're roughly in that four percent range. 
including a negative uh, downturn in 2023. Uh, Charlotte is not immune. Um, frankly, no market in this country is really immune from it. Um, with the exception of Colorado Springs, from what we track, is going to be um, kind of holding steady, maybe not declining, but again, depends on which submarket you're in. So, as a market as a whole, Charlotte down, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two percent a year. If you go submarket by submarket, it could be down. Some locations could be down, you know, eight to ten to twelve percent uh, next year. But I would say all of those kind of coalesce together over time in, in our market assumptions. And those same submarkets that we showed maybe double digit rent declines within Charlotte, we're going to show a similar recovery ultimately the following year in 2024 and beyond so that we can trend line the entire market much closer to that um, 4% average over the next five years. Um, so the next question uh, is, will you see renters in high class markets downgrade from class A to B or C? Um, I think Tom's going to go ahead and take that question. Um, so please go ahead, Tom. Um, looking forward to hearing your answer on that. It's interesting, the possible formation question being brought up. There was just an article, I believe, uh, published in Bloomberg regarding household formation a normal, specifically as it relates to renters, um, a normal, normalized time, uh, the number of per, uh, folks in an individual unit is somewhere between 1.4 and 1.5 people in a single residence in a rental community. Uh, that is now increased to almost two per rental community. So two people per rental community. And that's not a function of more two bedroom units. It's a function of people uh, merging together so they can afford the rents that are out there today. So people find a way to afford, even as affordability becomes more challenging, people find a way to afford. And, and one way to do that is slide from A to B to C, uh, depending on where you were, sliding down in asset quality. Now, I think it is more challenging for somebody who's experienced a luxury unit to move down to a B unit, but it can be done. And, and we talk about that on the, on the office side from time to time is and once you're in a, a true class A office, it's tough to go back to a B or a C office. However, I do think it can be done. I think the more likely scenario as people lose jobs or as their hours are cut or whatever, as the, the employment conditions change that Dave noted earlier as, as almost a requisite for, defe for defeating the inflation that's in place today, you will see some hardship and people will be forced to move from A to B and B to C. And you'll also see people who are more willing to take on a roommate to afford the rents even if they're in a B, right? And so I do think that that is a possible scenario, but I think roommating is a more likely scenario. Uh, next question would be, would rent growth have a minor effect on the income plus fund? Uh, it's a good question. And the, the baseline input for uh, performance for all of our investments, it really starts with, with rents. Um, that's your top line revenue number. Uh, so the ability to forecast it is the reason why accurately is the reason why we developed the multi fit multilytics platform to begin with. Uh, we weren't uh, we couldn't trust some of the third party data providers that were out there. We back tested the reliability of their forecasts. And this was something that Dave had asked for me to touch on previously. And I don't think I addressed it then, which was the accuracy of our forecasts. And I'm very proud to say that both through back testing, but then through the most volatile rent period that we've seen, frankly, in recorded record over the last two years, and depending on submarket location and property, we're somewhere in the range of, of 96 to 99% accurate, um, which is pretty impressive. And we looked at some of the forecasts provided by those three third-party data providers and it's, it's actually scarily inverse. Like they, some of the groups had predicted that uh, rents would be in, in a specific submarket would be the highest performing in a specific MSA. Uh, and if you actually would have invested in the lowest performing predicted submarket, you would have achieved the highest rent growth. It's a true negative correlation. So when we were looking at that, we said, look, we need to build something more reliable where we can understand the inputs and frankly, just more accurate. So long way of getting to the answer, um, this rent, rent growth has an impact on Income Plus Fund, but it has less of an impact than it does on our other funds where we're taking a first loss position 
and we don't have that subordination of common equity uh, ahead, of, ahead of us. So yes, if rents were really impaired um, at the uh, at the projects within the income plus fund, that would ultimately lead to some concern about the ability for those projects to ultimately be refinanced or sold, which would then retire our, our preferred equity position in those assets. So yes, it does have an impact, but as we talked about before, there's there's so much protection and subordination within those investments that the impairment on rent growth would have to be record breaking, uh, unforeseen, unprecedented in terms of having any material impact on those investments. Um, okay, so the next question is, what have been the main factors increasing cap rates in 2022? Interest rates, hands down. Um, so, and I think that's one of the things that, that I think about a lot every day is the fact that cap rates have moved out. And I kind of touched on this earlier, cap rates have moved out because interest rates have moved up. And if you're buying at a four cap or four and a quarter, but your interest rate, your interest expense is a six and a quarter before amortizing or even a six or five, anything above that is negative leverage. You don't want it. It's costing you more to have that debt than you're generating from the property. The only way you get out of that scenario is by increasing your revenue, in, in, which inherently increases your cap capitalization rate. If rent growth stops, your cap rate stays at 4%. If it goes from four, if rent growth continues, that four cap becomes a four and a half or five, and maybe you can grow yourself out of that negative leverage scenario. That's where a lot of folks were taking it uh, in late 2021 and early 2022. They were buying three and a half caps and a three and a half percent interest rate, but they had this expectation that three and a half cap would become a four cap because, <clears throat> excuse me, because they were able to push their rents higher and generate additional revenue in that, and in so that leverage becomes positive. That's not the case anymore. In, in most markets, the rent growth has stopped or even gone negative already, and the cap rates have moved up um, with interest rates. And I would expect they would move up a little bit further as people realize that rent growth uh, may not be as positive as they were originally underwriting. So, interest rates is number one, and then the tag onto that is uh, rent growth. Um, the next question is, can you take us through the process for preferred equity deals? Uh, happy to do that. And we started to go through this a little bit in terms of just where the investment structure within the capital stack. Um, but the, the process, if I understand, um, the question where, which is, you know, how do we identify and maybe how do we structure and then how do we exit those investments? Um, but the process really is that, you know, as we talked about before, when we close on the investment, we are ultimately occupying some subordinated position within the preferred equity stack. So just above the senior lender, but below the common equity holders. Uh, oftentimes that's 55 to 60 on the low end to 75 to 85 on the upper end. We'll just say 60 to 80 to keep it simple. Um, that's typically the position in which we occupy. And as we talked about before, today we're getting paid a 14% return on that. Now, one thing to note is in a, in a preferred equity position, you do not get to enjoy the benefits of the common equity holders, which is appreciation above your stated coupon rate. So said differently, if our, if our interest rate, if you will, which accrues, um, which means it's not paid current, it gets paid... It accrues, it grows, it compounds, and it gets paid uh, whenever we ultimately are retired through a sale or refinance. Um, that's 14% effectively is our interest rate, but we can't really we can't do better than that. Um, there's some exceptions to it where we get a multiple floor, um, and if if the of a, typically it's about a 1.4 in our position. So what that means if if someone retires our our prep position quickly, uh, early on in, in the development life cycle, they have to hit that multiple floor. And if it's only out for two years, um, which would be about a 1.3 multiple, um, we actually will get collect more revenue, more income through that payoff because they have to hit the one, our partners have to hit the one four. So what that does is that actually turns that 14 into like a 15 and a half. So that's the way you can get some additional upside, but you don't get to enjoy in common equity upside in the way that the, the, the investors are in, in the first loss position. So that's the trade-off in prep. 
Um, and, and typically once the investment's made, you know, we're, we're funding draws uh, after the common equity holder does. And then we are asset managing um, from our position until the, the project sold. Uh, okay, the last question we have here uh, is, is more PREF and income plus going to affect tax efficiency? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, and I would say that generally, yes, to a degree. I mean, very simply, PREF is not as tax efficient as a common as a common equity deal equivalent. And, and the reason being um, predominantly is depreciation. Uh, you don't, you are unable to get the depreciation benefits from a preferred equity investment uh, until you are, the asset is put into service. Um, and we do structure our operating agreements so that we can take advantage of that. So if our PREF investment is still, uh, hasn't been retired yet, and the project is eligible for depreciation, we get our pro rata share. Um, but the other, the, when you start getting current income, which is a benefit of how we structure our preferred equity investments is that they are accrual. We're not getting paid current like a lender does where they get ongoing interest payments. That is actually taxed at ordinary income. Um, the way we've structured it is that our investment compounds tax efficiently during that period. So you're not subject to ordinary income. Uh, and then you just pay uh, taxation on on your total uh, accrual basis um, upon upon uh, retirement of the of the investment. So common equities is more efficient in that you get the depreciation schedule immediately. Um, but again, I think we've safeguarded uh, the best that we can in the structure of those investments to maximize the otherwise somewhat tax inefficient um, preferred equity. Now at the fund level. Um, we are we do have some investments in common equity, and we we have a prior webinar where we actually talked about we're generating enough de depreciation benefits uh, from those assets within the fund to actually offset the income generated. So that's the benefit of this fund is that we actually have both pref and common, and we will as as we talked about before we are going to start to see opportunities for acquisitions again. And we will eventually add common equity to this portfolio. And notably through some of our build the core assets, when they become stabilized, uh, they will be put into the fund as common equity and they'll help create depreciation benefits to shield some of the, again, income um, or some of the tax efficiencies from prep. Um, so I think that that, uh, answers the last of our questions from the Q&A. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign us off from here. But thank you all for joining. Hope you enjoyed the predictions uh, for 2023 webinar and hope you and your families all have a safe and, and wonderful holidays. Thank you.